I'm Zach Childs and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today we are at 3614 Jackson Highway. If you don't know the importance of that address, you need to look it up. This is Muscle Shoals Sound Studio and today we have Jimmy Johnson with us. Jimmy, thank you for letting us come here and for taking the time to let us interview you. Uh, well, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. How did you start playing the guitar, and what were your, you know, how did you learn how to play the guitar originally? Well, I was influenced. Okay. By who? Chuck Berry. Yeah. And uh, I remember growing up, uh, when I, the first time I heard Johnny Be Good, mm -hmm. I said, I have to learn how to play that. Before that, it was in my family. My mother and daddy both played guitar. But I, they couldn't get me in it because they, they liked country music. And I hated country music. I like, what I like is, you know, real old traditional country. Mm -hmm. I don't like the, the, the top 40 now Yeah. in the country music. Ugh. So what were That's some, a joke. So what was the, what was the era of the? What were some of the artists in the? You're just talking about like Hank Williams Senior and and not uh, Junior. No, no, yeah, he, exactly. even he it had to be yeah. Hank Williams Senior. Okay, and who <laughs> who are some other er, early country artists that you like? Uh, uh, I like Webb Pierce. Yeah, so fifties like Hank Snow. Yeah. You know, yeah. moving on. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but uh, you know, I go all the way back to. I'm walking the floor over you, you know. Yeah. You remember him? Yes. Yes. And it's and Texas, then there was and a, it's Texas there was a guy from Alabama named Cowboy Copas. Yeah. Did you ever hear him? Yes, sir. And he was from Alabama, and uh, of course, you know, that he, uh, he was pretty popular with us. But your but your ear got pulled by R and B music and Chuck. Oh you know, yeah. I, the only thing that inspired me, I, I I couldn't get turned on to country at all. Okay. And uh, and I still don't like the current. I like traditional country, like as I told you. Right. But uh, I don't. I really don't like the the top forty country chart today. Oh. To me, it ain't even country. Yeah, it's it's too too far a distance from it. So it's man, roots. It, it, it's it's gone so many directions. You know. Yeah. Mm. So, were you just copying Chuck Berry from the record? Did you have somebody, uh, like a buddy, showing you well, how to play uh, this? Or? I, I did have a, a guy in the area who showed me how to play it. Okay. And, and he, he had it nailed. Mm -hmm. And so, that gave me a, a little advanced move, a move there. And, and I, but when I started playing, we got a, we got a band together. And uh, the band was called the Del Rays. Yeah. And uh, by the way, that means from the Kings. There was a Del Rey band also in St. Louis. Okay. That a friend of mine that I, I produced a session on, uh, a guy named Russ Bono, and uh, he... Uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Well, from St. Louis, uh, Michael McDonald. That's him. Yeah. Okay. He was in the he was in the in, Del Rays. In the Del Rays, the Del Rays that were in St. Louis. St. Louis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this band kind of morphed into uh, playing frat parties, correct? Well, we did. Uh, we started. Uh, we got into doing fraternities on weekends mm -hmm. in all the southeastern schools. Yeah. And were you going to school during the week, or were you working during the week during uh, this time? I was both. Okay. What and were you uh, working doing? I was working at Fame Studios. Okay, so you were. Already... I was Rick Hall's first employee. Okay, and you were and you were booking booking sessions and and well, were you when I started by that out, point? I was just kind of an assistant, yeah. and a, a gopher. Yeah. And then it moved on up. To, you know how you always do. I started engineering and doing sessions and. He got pissed when I cut my first hit, you know. <laughs> he, he wanted to be the guy that cut all the hits. Right. In his studio. Yeah. And what was your first hit that you cut? Uh, there was about there's about three uh, that I cut. Uh, remember a song called Roadrunner by the Gants? Yeah. I cut that record. Okay. The G-A-N-T-S. Okay. Like the shirt. Yeah. 
So you cut that, and you were you were working for Rick, and yeah. the, and and you were playing in the in the Del Rey's. Yeah. And uh, when when did you? That was weekends. Yeah. But during the week, I was working for Rick. And when did you start actually playing sessions as a guitarist? Uh, I didn't start playing sessions till about nineteen. I guess it was. 64, around 64. Okay. And then it's by the time we 66 rolled around, that's when I cut One of Man Loves a Woman. Right, with Percy Sledge. Yeah, I cut yeah. that. I was the engineer. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing even though you were engineering these sessions, you were, you were learning while you were watching what other guitar players did, and you were learning what to do and kind of maybe what not to do also. Well, you know, I was getting to really get to, I, mean, I got to meet a lot of the guitar players coming into our studio at, at fame mm -hmm. and uh and so you know I, you know of course the original guy terry was still one of the best players we ever had and this was terry thompson terry thompson yeah but he uh he actually he's the guy that cut uh you better move on okay you know with, with arthur alexander yeah yeah so june alexander Pardon me? His name was June Alexander. June Alexander? That but he was, went by uh, Arthur. Uh, that was, uh, he had okay. records out under June. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. We The Delrays used to cut one of his big uh, local hits called The Girl That Radiates That Charm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of intersects a little bit. In uh, one of our past interviews, we talked with uh, Reggie Young, and Reggie Young mentioned that he had come down to uh, to Muscle Shoals for a while to uh, to fill to fill mm -hmm. in after after Terry's right. passing. So right. So we I guess Terry had big shoes to fill. Yeah. You know. He really did. Uh, nobody really ever beat him. Oh, wow. But I got to hear him play and uh, he played on some records for me that I was working on that you know myself. Yeah. And uh so I got to spend a little time with him before he died. Yeah. Did you learn much from him? No, you really couldn't learn because he was so advanced okay. as a player that, uh, he, I mean, he was so far ahead of everybody that, I mean, he was like a, a moon jump ahead. Yeah. I'm telling you. Mm. He was that good. Mm. What would you say is the best example of Terry Thompson's playing that someone can listen to? Uh, probably some records I have at my office. Okay. But not <laughs> something that's commercially available? Uh, no. Okay. Now, I think he did play on You Better Move On. Okay. And uh, you know the little... The little, yeah, yeah. A little up lick. Yeah. You know, that was him. But he he was he, but he played, he would play lead and rhythm at the same time. Okay, you know. Yeah, didn't need to have an, a second guitar player no. with him. Yeah, he really didn't. Hmm. So things start you know kind of picking up when uh, when you start getting, you know, of course when Atlantic starts starts kind of coming onto the scene. They, they come along after we did One Man Loves Woman. They picked right. up. They picked the first up record. Right. And uh, which was '66, and, uh, and then from then on, yeah. they were flying us to New York, right? Starting in '67. Yeah. So and and the, the people that were going to New York was me and Roger Hawkins, and uh, the bass player was uh, Tommy Cogbill. Tommy Cogbill. And the uh, guitar player with me was Chips Moman. Mm -hmm. so, and he was playing on Mustang Sally and all that stuff, too. Right. You know? Yeah. Wilson's brought in by Jerry Wexler, and y'all cut Land of a Thousand Dances, and you cut uh, Mustang, Mustang Sa Sally, Sally, and uh, and umpteen others. Yeah. And and you're, you and, and Chips are the main guitar players. The two, on, on two main guys. And, yeah. and then Conville, when he first started playing with us, he was playing guitar. Yeah, because he's a great guitar player. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And, uh, he was, and so we had three guitars playing okay. uh, you know, a lot of the songs. Yeah. 
So then we we move up to uh, you know Aretha, and of course the, the story's been told a lot about about the the happenings on that session, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, you eventually—that's when the, you start getting flown up to New York, and mm-hmm. you start the Aretha sessions that are that are after after the first two songs. We uh, actually would drive to Memphis and catch a, our first jet flight to uh, LaGuardia. Uh huh. <laughs> it was a big deal. I bet it was. It was. Yeah, it was for uh, us. Yeah, yeah, it's, it was it's, me and Roger and Spinner. Yeah, it was like culture shock. Yeah. The, yeah. the three of us were, f- were going from here, yeah. and then Chips and uh, Cogville from, from up there. Yeah. So, on those sessions, when you when you get up to New York, I've always been curious about this. So, on the tune "Respect," is that Chips playing the the opening, you know, lick? Uh, that is Chips. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. And then, down. yeah, no, that was Chips. Okay, because there's always been yeah. a whole lot of conjecture about who played that. That was him. Yeah, people will say everything from Cornell Dupree to Steve Cropper and everything in no. between, but it was Chips. It was chips. What, what was Chips? Was that kind of indicative Chip, of, of Chips, chips had style? A, had a real knack for coming up with great licks. Mm-hmm. Just bam, right? You know, spur of the moment. Yeah. And 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 every time we sat down, he he would come up with a good one. Wow, you know. And so those first sessions in in New York, it's Tom, Tommy's playing bass, you're playing guitar, and uh, and Chips is playing guitar. And, and uh, Roger was on drums. Yeah. And uh, Spooner was on on uh, keys. Now on the Aretha date, she was playing grand. Right. The 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 yeah. big grand piano. And Spooner would play electric or, or organ. Yeah. And from what I understand, her piano playing was pretty essential to Oof. those. Yeah. Well, I think it's what really uh, allowed it to happen. Yeah. Because she was a player like you can't imagine. Yeah. There's uh, one, one of her albums, uh, Amazing Grace. Did you ever hear that song, Natural Woman? Yes. Did you yeah. like that? Yeah. Well, you know, you remember the arranger on, on that that did the strings? Was that Arif or I'm That's not sure? Arif Martin, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and here all of a sudden we go up there and we start meeting these people you know, like from Turkey. Yeah. yeah. I'm at Ard- yeah, Erdogan. I'm at Erdogan and Wexler. And, 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 yeah. yeah. and and what's so funny, you know, the Atlantic uh the top echelon of the company was two Arabs and a Jew. Yeah, yeah, Wexler. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> pretty, pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, very, very international. Well, you never met a, a guy smarter or better vocabulary than Wexler. Yeah. Man, now I used to have to. I, I'd carry a dictionary with me to New York to find out what tell he was saying. <laughs> Now you're you're meeting all these guys at Atlantic. You've got Tom Dowd and Jerry Wexler and all these characters. Tell me, and of course you've also great one was King Curtis. Oh, the saxophonist. Yeah, yeah. And he played on all the sessions with his horn section. Yeah, that's who played on the Atlantic stuff. Mm. Mm. Curtis Owsley. Curtis Owsley. Yeah. You know what happened to him? He got he got shot. He was murdered. On his front, yeah. brownstone, yeah. and he 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 went out to uh, run somebody off, you know, that was up there raising hell. Yeah, and he opened the door, and the guy killed him. That's horrible. What a yeah. loss! What yeah. an what an yeah. amazing a big quarter. loss there with Ken yeah. Curtis, man. Yeah, you know, we had a Grammy. We won a Grammy with him just for an instrumental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you compare? How would you compare? Well, that was the solo, you know, on respect. Yeah. Did you notice what happened on that solo? Yeah, it's like it modulates. It goes like to another key or well, something. Well, uh, right on the downbeat of the solo, mm-hmm. it, you, we modulate to yeah. a new key. Yeah. And then when we come back to the verse, we 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 modulate down. Yeah. 
back to the original key. Yeah, <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a neat move. But and, wasn't, yeah. wasn't that a great move? Uh, I mean, yeah. the way it was done. Yeah, it gave it a lift. Yeah, because whenever it you did. modulate, and, it, it's yeah. like it, it raised it. I think it was like a one step or something yeah. from the from the tonic, mm-hmm. and and it's like it, it picked it up. Yeah. You know, man. And that's where you're able to pick up the solo yeah. without trying to get louder yeah. or anything else. It's just it a, would a, automatic, it just automatically yeah. happened. Yeah. So would you, how would you compare the production styles of Rick Hall, Tom Dowd, and uh, and I guess Jerry Wexler? I guess Jerry Wexler was a bit more Jerry of an executive. Jerry Wexler was more the guy that picked material and uh, signed the artist and... Yeah. And uh, and he would he he'd always be there and he'd always uh, you know be involved with every faction of it, but a lot of times other people would see uh, uh, Tommy Dowd and a reef were assisting right. him right and on the floor and then of course a reef would do all the arrangements yeah Whew. yeah and now we cut a record that the four of us consider the best record we ever cut. And it was an instrumental record called Glass Onion. Okay. And this album is not available anymore. Mm-hmm. It never was a CD. It was no. only on the LP. And w- wasn't that an Arif album? Was it under was it, it was under Arif's name? name. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was under it was his record. Yeah. But I mean, uh, see, he was doing all those records by the Young Rascals. Mm-hmm. You remember all that yes. stuff. Yeah. So there's one or two Rascals records. We got you know, there's a lot of different cuts in there. Stones. Yeah. And you know, how would you compare Rick Hall with Tommy Dowd, being a more a more direct you know producer? Completely different. Okay. What are the differences? Uh, the difference. Uh, <clears throat> With styles, mm-hmm. I mean, and and uh, approaches. Tommy Dowd was a bloody genius, mm-hmm. and in the true sense of the word. Right. You know what he did? Yes, he worked on the Manhattan Project. He, I mean, yeah. which was the atomic bomb. Yes. In in New York, mm-hmm. and uh, but he he was uh, highly. Uh, he, he was so genius that I th- we used to come up with, with stuff like, let's see if we can come up with something that he don't know about. Mm-hmm. And we'd say, well, Tommy, how does how does this work? How does this do that? And we, we'd just f- grew with him. Yeah. And boy, he, he would sit there and explain it all day to you. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> and we ate it up. Yeah. And contrast that with uh, with Rick Hall. Well, Rick was like uh, he would yell and okay. and like uh, I never had him with me, and I don't for some reason I was going to college, and Rick never went to college, and he always wanted to. Okay, and so most of the guys that were playing back then, like Roger, and they, they were not college people. Okay. <clears throat> but me and David Hood were. Okay. A comment that had been made by a guitar player that wanted to remain nameless on this was that uh, Rick liked to do take after take after take, and that in yeah. this guitar player well, I indicated... I think Rick yeah. Hall later on realized that early takes were probably the best takes. Okay. But during the period that we grew up with him learning to produce, mm-hmm. uh, it would be on take uh, 98... Mm. About the third day in, that wears you out. One song, and, and and back then, he was paying us like a session every three songs. <laughs> now you know it might take us a week to cut three songs, right? And so we got our practice in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but you were you were paying you were really paying your dues. Now, but he was highly he was very talented, and and all, he was the type of guy that only he knew when when he liked it and when he got it, mm-hmm. when it suited him. Yeah. So I mean, I, I couldn't learn by watching him produce. 
No, I didn't learn anything. Okay. And, my, and most people didn't. Yeah. But uh, but he was, he was very talented, and one thing he was good at was picking songs. And he was a songwriter. Yeah. But that's the whole key to coming up with hits is, is, is the songs. Having good songs to begin having with. great songs to cut on the artist you're recording. Because great songs are easier to play and it's easier, it. to, easier to come up with parts on a great if, song. Yeah, otherwise, if you don't have great songs, you don't have great hits. Yeah. <laughs> what was one of the worst songs you ever cut? I don't know. I tried to forget them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go, going back to just the uh, the Aretha sessions, so at, at some point... Uh, well, now, now, she blew our mind pretty good. Yeah. Because we had never worked with a singer like her. Yeah. At that time, nobody had. Yeah. <laughs> and so when she started singing and stretching out and playing mm -hmm. all at the same time, it was just about more than you could stand. Yeah. Now, would she cut playing piano and singing yeah. at the same time? Uh -huh. Okay. But now, well, what we'd do, we'd track it. Right. We'd track it and uh, we'd always, <clears throat> after we got through tracking, she would immediately get up and go to the to the mic and sing a pilot down. While y'all went to the control room. We'd go in the control room and she'd yeah. freeze us to death in there. Yeah. Killing it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just, she would bring tears to years. Yeah. Was there ever any problem with her her vocal from the tracking session being, you know, bleeding into the mic and, and having trouble with but that? She, the, but she wasn't singing yeah. then. Okay. We, we'd always do a track. Okay. We'd do a track, you know, we'd, for, we'd work it out. Okay. And she'd be singing. And yeah. then she'd quit singing, and then we'd do a track. Okay. Then, then, then yes. that way was no leakage. Now I understand. So you you would track with no you would you would practice the song with her singing it. And then when you track it, she would not sing. She'd it. She'd just then, stop singing and keep playing. Them. Okay. You know. And then she'd come back and do and do her lead vocal immediately. And up. I mean, just yeah. a second. Yeah. We'd get through. She'd stand up, man, and go right to the mic. Yeah. And we'd come in there and go. Yeah. So then. The uh, the the players start kind of changing out because then then Chip stops showing up on the on the Aretha yeah. sessions. Well, see, they were had all the American stuff started happening big right. time, and the, and he he couldn't get free. I mean, right. he was producing most of all that stuff. Yeah. So he had it. Mike Leach also to play bass. I guess when yeah. Cogbill was Cogbill, gone, and Cogbill and yeah. Cogbill would st would start producing. Right. Tommy but, Cogbill was a super guy. Yeah, his. His bass playing was, he was it kind was, of the beginning was, of some of that busy uh, style that you also heard right, from Motown, but, but it was, Jamerson. <clears throat> yeah, but he had a different style. He had the Tommy Cogbill style. Yeah. And it was the way he plucked them. Yeah. And they all did it by hand. Yeah. You know, no pick. Right. And yeah. you know, a lot of the guys would always pick. Right, because a, a lot of guys were going from the guitar, guitar to the, to to the, the bass. bass. Not many guys were going no. from upright. Well, yeah. right. Yeah. What's one thing about Norbert Putnam? Remember yeah. Norbert? Yes. He was from here and uh, in the first rhythm section, and he played also stand-up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. Chips stopped showing up, and then you start seeing Joe South. Joe the... South was incredible yeah. from Atlanta. What was what was his contribution? It, it When... When you hear like the opening of, of uh, Chain of Fools, mm -hmm. you hear this like low tuned guitar, mm -hmm. and well, is that Joe South? The E down to yeah, you know yeah. Is that Joe? That's Joe. Okay, and that was kind of that seemed that, that everyone yeah. thinks it's like a baritone guitar or something like that, no. but that was Joe. That's all it was. Yeah. <laughs> so and also and he had that, he yeah. and I had the same guitar. Yeah. We both we both played Gretsch, Chet yeah. Atkins model Gretsch. Yes, the orange model. Yeah, the hollow body, yeah. the single cutaway. Yeah, yeah. We both had one. It's funny. We'd be our guitars would be on the carpet, mm -hmm. on the Atlantic floor. You know, we'd just lay them on the floor. Yeah, and uh, on the carpet, and uh, 
and there was two uh, Gretches yeah. side by side, identical. Now, I, I heard that that yours had showbud pickups. Something. Well, I, I had them put on after okay. some uh, time. Mine was a used guitar. Okay. And then I had I came up and uh, remember uh, at, at Showbud. Yeah. Uh, he was he did them. He put them on himself for me. Yeah. So shot Jackson yeah, did it. He did it. Yeah. So what what were you? Was there something wrong with the pickups that were on the Gretsch, or you were wanting a different sound? No. I, he just said yeah. He said I, I've got some pickups I'd like to put on there. Okay. He said uh, they're hotter, and I said, yeah. "Go for it." Go for it. Did you like them better? Oh man! Yeah, killer. Yeah. So uh, that guitar got stolen. Oh, I was about I was about to ask you. But then I got a call from Gretch. Mm -hmm. It's been about five, six years ago, maybe ten years ago. Yeah. And they called me and said. Uh, would you do an interview with us? They said it yeah. saw where I'd used it on a lot of the records. Yeah, <clears throat> and they said uh, in lieu of this interview, says we got a brand new Gretsch on the way to you, nice. and it came in the next day. Yeah, y'all see that guitar? It's a pretty guitar. Pretty guitar you ever laid your eyes on. Wow. And what I had was like an old, old model, same one. Right. But, uh, man, that guitar would send you to the moon. Yeah. So how did you end up, so after playing the Gretsch for a while, and then it had the show, so it got stolen. Well, and so you didn't I buy. You, who, you, who convinced me was Bobby Womack. Oh, to get a Telecaster. <clears throat> yeah, he said, he said, Jimmy, what you need to do is you need to go by Manny's on the way home. Mm -hmm. before you go home and pick you up one of these tellies. Yeah. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I want you to try this. So I tried it, yeah. and it was okay, you know. But then after I played it a little bit, I couldn't play any. I didn't want to play nothing else. Yeah. And basically didn't later on. Yeah. And uh, I, well, a guy, they wound up making me a Jimmy Johnson model of Swamper guitar. Yeah. And it was a, a clone, uh, you know, a uh, uh, telly. What was it about the telly that uh, made you want to play it? I don't know. I, 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 I liked the sound of it. Uh, I liked the pickups and, you know, yeah. I don't know. It, it it's, it's funny. I, I, had, I, had, I always had plenty of trouble. Yeah. You know, in the, in the trouble position. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It was just uh, really a great guitar. Yeah. Talking again, talking to Reggie. Reggie indicated that Bobby got a telly because of him. Said that. Okay. Said, yeah. Said Bobby was playing an arch top guitar that he'd gotten from New York. It was right. a handmade arch top when they were in Memphis, and that you know Reggie you, was playing you a know telly. How many albums we did with Womack? You did a bunch. About about three or four, and they were all like quadruple platinums. Yeah. Unbelievable. He's a great songwriter and Ooh. and. Uh, Guitar player, man. So did did Bobby influence? And he did his yeah. he did his own backgrounds. Really? And and you know it'd be like a, you remember the brothers, the Womack brothers? Yeah. They were, they well, were the Valentinos. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And uh, they would, uh, he would tell them what parts to sing. Mm-hmm. And so he knew what everybody should be singing, and he he could do it. Yeah, and so when he was doing his sessions, all them great hits was just him. Yeah, remember looking for a love. Yeah, that wasn't bad, right? No, it wasn't, wasn't bad at all. So number one. Yeah. So did Bobby? Bobby's guitar. Now again, Reggie said that Bobby was a huge influence on his guitar playing. Did I'm sure he was. Yeah. So because, uh, and he was on a, a, some of those yeah, Aretha he, he, sessions. He played on a lot of the, uh, see, Pickett brought him down to fame. Okay. And then, uh, and also uh, uh, Wexler had him down too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then he was carrying him to New York. Mm -hmm. And so I was up for a New York session when he got me in to go get my own, get your own telly. telly. Boy, I know. I always thank him for that. Yeah. So it was interesting. There's uh, there's footage of some of the the sessions, and and you can see uh, 
Tommy, you know, playing, you know, playing bass, and and there's Joe South, and there's Bobby, and there's you. There's three guitar players mm -hmm. on the sessions. Yeah, that's right. And how did y'all divvy stuff up? I mean, was it just kind of the, you, you, you know, was there any kind of hierarchy? Do you remember or? that guy in New York was playing bass too? Uh, Jerry Jamont. Yeah. That started playing on the yeah. later stuff, and, yeah. and Tommy went over to guitar. Well, Jerry yeah. was a great bass player. Yeah. I mean, he played, to me, more like the Detroit stuff. Okay, Jerry Jamont. Yeah, yeah. but he could, play, he could play that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but you talk about a cool guy. You know who he was married to? Who? Roberta Flack. Oh, wow. Yeah. First time I saw your face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> great, great singer, great song. <laughs> How did... Yeah, how did Tommy end up switching from uh, from bass to guitar? Because then on the on the next album on uh, Aretha, well, he, he was Aretha playing now. guitar first, I think. Right, but on the Aretha sessions, he was playing bass for a while, and yeah. then all of a sudden. But, but uh, on the when we started playing, well, with him, uh, uh, and that was picket sessions, mm -hmm. and it was me and he and Chips playing right. guitar together. Right, these three guitars. Yeah. What was one of two or some more of the Pickett records we did? Well, there was the exciting Wilson Pickett, and that's the one that's half stacks and half muscle shoals. Mm -hmm. And then the, the one after that is called Wicked Pickett. You've got like yeah, Funky Wicked Broadway Pickett, yeah, and, and, and uh, Funky Broadway. That okay. was it. Yeah. 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 That was an interesting little record one. That was my yeah. Gretsch. Yeah. You're still playing the, the Gretsch at that point. Yeah. Yeah. What about amps? It looks my like my favorite amp is always a, a Vibrolux, okay. Fender Vibrolux. Yeah. yeah. The reason is, I like the two tens, mm -hmm. and I, I also like six L sixes, and not six V sixes. The deluxe amps, you know, they look the same. Right. But they didn't have quite the power. Right. And because they wasn't the six L six, right? The six L sixes have more uh, five eight eight one. Yeah, even, they, you know, they have more low industrial end. number. Yeah. Was it because I of the used low to end go and the buy wideness? The five eight eight ones, and I'd replace all the six L six because they were more stout, yeah. And stronger. Yeah. Yeah. So so Vibrolux and a Telecaster. That was that was kind of your rig. <laughs> and, uh, and, and a great. Yeah. And when so, you, I, did you have both it. for a while? Yeah, I, 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 I did them both. You know, I'd, I'd have started out in New York, and you know, I had the Gretsch. Yeah. And then when he convinced me, Bobby, I was up there, it happened. Yeah. Told me to go buy Mandy's and pick me up one. Yeah. Guess what it cost me? How much? Two thirty. Yeah. Two hundred thirty bucks. That was nineteen sixty-eight. Yeah. Well, that see, that was probably. 67 or 68. Okay. Yeah. Jimmy, tell me about some of the guitar players that came through. You had, uh, I guess, you know, you had Junior Lowe, and then you had Eddie Hinton and all these guys. Tell us about some of the other guitar players that, that came yeah, through well, Junior fame. Lowe was a guy that he was actually a stand-up bass player. Okay. And, uh, and he, that's how I, I first saw him. And he was playing in town maybe 10 years before I was. Okay. And uh, Junior is a cowboy. Okay. I mean, and he rides horses and the whole bit. Yeah. Know? And, uh, but Junior uh, is was one funny guy. And he was, uh, he was another, you know, kind of telly guy. Well, you know. yeah, he, he was, and he played... Uh, he, he was also a kind of a country telly. Okay. You know. Yeah. And he could play, he could play. Now, we used to play a little nightclub up at the line mm -hmm. called Eddie's Place. Okay. If you can imagine Eddie's Place. Okay. It's a beer joint. Yeah. And so Junior was singing, and you know, back then. Singing some so country. So we, we did a lot of stuff with Junior. Okay. Me and Roger did. Yeah. And so was he part of the the move when when you moved to to this location when you moved to Muscle Shoals Sound? He was invited, but he right. didn't want to leave fame. 
Okay. So he said he want he wanted to stay. Okay. I said okay, and so we took Eddie. Okay, Eddie Hinton. Man, yeah. I tell you, you found a better guitar player than him. That's hard. Yeah, I I wasn't really aware of Eddie Hinton until now, you know that Glass Onion album I was telling you about. Yeah. That's all Eddie. Okay. What What I was going to say was uh, there's a a French documentary that was done, and they shot some stuff at Fame, and in it, uh, golly, who recorded Rainy Night in Georgia? Uh, Tony Joe White. Uh, and he wrote he wrote the song oh, Brooke Benton. Brooke Benton. So it's footage of Brooke well, Benton. Let's see. Uh, Donnie Fritz pitched that song to Wexler for Brooke Benton. Okay. But it was a Tony Joe White tune. Because he wrote it, right? Did you know it? Yeah, I did. But I didn't yeah. know that Donnie Fritz had pitched it to him. Yeah. Yeah. So in in the footage, it's uh, it's Brooke Benton, and he's at uh, at at Fame. And uh, Eddie Hinton's playing guitar on it. I didn't know. I didn't know who he was. And I, 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 uh, I sent a message to to Reggie Young and asked, "Who's that guitar player?" He said, "That's Eddie Hinton." And I <laughs> didn't. I didn't know who he was until Reggie clued me in on him. So tell us a little bit more about about Eddie. What was stylistically? Eddie what was, was he from Tuscaloosa. Okay. And uh, he was a little younger than we were at the, back at the time and. And so when he moved to Muscle Shoals, he first moved up and started working at Quinn Ivy's studio with Marlon Green. And then he slowly, we started playing sessions on Percy stuff down at, at uh, it was Marlon Green producing. And uh, uh, he uh, he started playing on all those records, and that last record when we first met him, started playing with him. Yeah. And then... We didn't take him on then. Rick never liked him. Hmm. Why do you think? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he couldn't get along. I think maybe he saw an attitude uh, from maybe Eddie he didn't like. But Eddie, uh, and 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 I, I never did. I, I always worked very well with Eddie and uh, had no problems at all. But uh, I guess certain personalities clash. Yeah. And uh, and Rick never would really use him. Hmm. And, uh, and 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 see, Dwayne came along. Right. And he started using Dwayne instead of Eddie. But not Eddie. He never he never used Eddie. Hmm. And then when we went to uh, thirty six, we brought Eddie with us. Yeah. How long How long did Eddie stay with? He you? stayed about three years. Okay. And, and was he leave, did he leave because he was having no he he left he said he wanted to go out and start his own cutting his own records okay and uh, did you ever hear his records yeah very extremely dangerous the, the it's records. not bad is it no, it's not bad at all <laughs> <laughs> and he was a, yeah I was Ed glad was that a hell of a singer yeah yeah hell of a singer hell of a hell of writer a, yeah hell of a guitar player so it was uh wasn't he? Was it he and Donnie Fritz that uh, wrote "Breakfast in Bed"? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I tell you, one that uh, I, I love Reggie on so much was uh, that Dusty Springfield record. Yeah, the Dusty in Memphis record. Remember, yeah, but remember the the song? Yeah, well, the son, son of, of the a preacher, preacher man. Yeah. Very. The, the, yeah. The, all that chiming and stuff. I mean, yeah. Woo. Yeah. It yeah, was just m- yeah. more than you could. Yeah. As Reggie, it won my heart then. Yeah, so there seems to be kind of a, and obviously it has. There's all sorts of different elements in this, but but there's kind of a Memphis Muscle Shoals guitar style to a degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, you know, you can take like what what you do and what uh, Reggie and Steve Cropper and there and Eddie Hinton uh, there were you know some there are some similarities and especially in those you know kind of sliding you know kind of guitar sounds not playing with a slide but just in the in the rhythm chinks and mm-hmm. different things like that where did that come from I think a lot of that came from Terry Thompson okay and uh and of course, Rick Hall liked that so much. We were always doing that on his records. Right. The rhythm, the, the chinks, chinks yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And uh, so, 
it, it kind of went and it just became part of what we did. Yeah. That became kind of what one of the things that the you, you were known for yeah. also. Mm-hmm. What were some of the other, you know, stylistic things that you kind of felt like you were, that was part of your stamp as a guitarist? Just uh, in, in rhythm in, in general. Yeah. You know. Did you ever hear a song called Lies? J.J. Kale. That's him. Okay. Yeah. Could he play or what? He, he could certainly <laughs> play. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was pretty amazing. Yeah. So we've had all these guitar players uh, come through. I mean, uh, if, during a period of years. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, what about Pete Carr? Pete Carr was a great player. So, uh, so Pete is you know connected to Dwayne Allman, and uh, you, you know, know because how. he played in the in the Hourglass also. You know why? Because they were both from Florida. Yeah, but where? Uh, Daytona, okay. That's yeah. where they were from. And so they were from that area, mm-hmm. and so uh, Pete Carr played with uh, Dwayne and Greg, and then mm-hmm. uh, and then he later on was able to cut the mustard as a guitarist and, uh, and start... Hey, we playing. even had a set of musicians from Buffalo, New York come down. Really? And... Uh, it was like, you know, full section. Mm-hmm. And uh, you remember Gary Baker? Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty good songwriter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the sessions with the staple singers, like I'll Take You There and Respect and such, who were, who were the guitar players on that besides you? It's, it's mainly me and Eddie. Okay. So it's you and Eddie doing yeah. those guitars. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, most of those were. Yeah, and and then we you know we we move on and, and you and you get into the the era where you were playing with Traffic for a while and mm-hmm. and then uh, and then the the work with uh, with Paul Simon and uh, yeah and how you know, how busy were you at this point? I went seven years without a day off. One that, time. That's not yeah, healthy. I had two divorces during that period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pay, paid the price for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There there was so much work coming in, and it was it hard was, to say It no. was like every Monday morning would have a new act. Yeah. Every Monday morning. Yeah. And, 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 and my, they're usually different kind. Yeah. You know, like we'd come from Johnny Rivers to... Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, and you you had you were smart enough to have your own publishing company, and, and you had your own you had yeah, your own that group was, of writers. That wound up being our biggest flow of income. Yeah, was publishing yeah. because then you could keep getting those residuals. To the well, publishing. Well, we yeah. did own the copyrights. Right, that was the big deal. Yeah, and so when people would come in with material, yeah, you know, maybe you had something that was and better. BMI wasn't bad either. Yeah, and ASCAP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, and if someone needed more material for their we album, we had about we had five publishing companies. Wow, what what are uh, what are some of the songs that uh, that are are uh, are the most you know are the highest income generating for you? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, well, we had a song, a little song called "Torn Between Two Lovers." Okay, <laughs> yeah, remember that? Yes, and that was Pete Carr on acoustic. Okay, and. Uh, that was a pretty interesting record, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Peter Yarrow co-wrote that with uh, one of our writers, okay. Phil Gerald. Yeah. And uh, we split the publishing. Of course, we met Paul Simon, and he introduced us to Peter Yarrow. Yeah. Always, you know. There was somebody that lead us to somebody else, you know. Right. It was constantly happening. Yeah. One of the things that's unique about... Uh, about the group that you were in, about the Swampers, was just how y'all could be chameleons and how you could play on these sessions. You didn't really have a signature sound and you would morph into whatever the well, band we needed would, to we be. We would try to, you know, change and not play the same licks all the time. But probably, yeah. uh, we would try to never play the same lick twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if that's... Yeah. 
it's it's you know it's it's crazy to think about you know the fact that you all played on you know still crazy after all these years, <laughs> and and then you know we went to New York and did that really still crazy. Okay, uh, the Paul Simon stuff we did was here was Kodachrome. Loves me like a rock. Okay. But, uh, did you ever hear the story on loves me like a rock? No. There's a whole story about that. Okay. He had cut this record down in Jamaica. Okay. With with uh, with reggae musicians. Uh, no. Oh. Well, they they were, but uh, they wasn't doing reggae. Okay. But uh, he. Uh, well, you know, he did a reggae album, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, and you remember, uh, you remember the guy that was, uh, what was his name? Uh, I think he died. Uh, he's got a son. That's uh, that's made it pretty big. Okay, well, there's Bob Marley and that's Ziggy him. Marley. Yeah. That's, that's the two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we never worked with Ziggy. Okay. We worked with, uh, I mean, Bob on the road when we was on traffic. He was fronted for us. Really? Yeah. So you got to play with Bob Marley. Yeah, and traffic, yeah. Was, you know, traffic was the main act. Yeah. And uh, what, was the, what was that like? It was interesting. We we, uh, we went on two world tours, yeah, with traffic, and about a about a two year uh, had a, we had a two year lapse, yeah. and went out again. And we did all of Europe. Did like fourteen cities in Germany. So, as technology changed, when did you start using any type of effects at all on your guitar? Constantly. Okay. So what were some of the early, I mean, there was like the wah-wah uh, and volume pedals and things. Well, you yeah. know, everything from fuzz tones to uh, uh, phase pedals. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, I had all the, I had a whole entourage of pedals. Yeah. And uh, and I, and I, I, that's one thing I had fun doing. Okay. Is to get different sounds. Yeah. Because um, otherwise, playing every day, it's hard to, you know, not play the same thing again. When you're when you're using just a raw guitar and amp sound, even you know, yeah. changing pickups well, or whatever. You could, you know, yeah. There's no way. And so I was using effects to hide hide it was right. me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so what what are some uh, some of your favorite favorite examples of you using effects? I had this. Uh, it was a, called a rotor sound, roto sound. Okay. And it was a pedal. Mm -hmm. Volume and a wah. Okay. And, and but you ought to have heard this damn thing. <laughs> this thing, and I used it on Seeger records. I, I used yeah. it on, constantly. Yeah. For years. And uh, did you ever hear Luther Ingram? Yeah. That wasn't a bad record. Either. No. <laughs> Loving you is wrong. I don't want to be right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> those are those are great records. <laughs> So you 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 embraced you know, effects. You weren't you weren't afraid to use them. They're a great way of getting uh, extra colors. Oh no. Yeah, and continued to play the the telly and the vibralux and, and use yeah. different effects. And then of course you were playing a lot of acoustic too. Not much. Not much. Okay. Uh, most time I was playing electric. Okay. And a so, little bit acoustic. Yeah. I, I actually I played uh, acoustic on uh, never I think. It's one of the early Aretha sessions I did uh, acoustic. Okay. And, uh, what? So in, in a typical in kind of the in this studio in Muscle Shoals Sound. So typically, when you were tracking, you would play electric. You know, there'd be Barry Beckett playing some type of keyboard instrument, and then of course you got Hood on bass, you got Roger playing drums, and then whoever the other guitar player would either play second. Electric or, or would play acoustic for, mm -hmm. for tracking? Yeah. Usually uh, the other guy was um, real efficient on acoustic. Okay. And uh, so I, I let him yeah. take care of that. Yeah. And, and, when you, and when you cut acoustic, did you use the restroom? I did. Yeah. I, I did with Cher one time. <laughs> and she come in there combing her hair. 
That's a small restroom. I used it earlier. Yeah, well, she was combing her hair, and you know, down to here. Yeah. And so, I was sitting on the john playing guitar. Okay. And there's a microphone there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and Beckett lets me know immediately. Yeah. I can't quit playing. I have to keep music. I have to keep playing. Yeah. So he knows that your hands. My are, hands are, are busy. Yes, busy on the guitar, not yeah. busy some, doing uh, something doing yeah, something else. Her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you would have loved Cher. Uh-huh. She was uh, probably one of the. We went out to the Grammys that year. Okay. And uh, she treated us royalty out there. Really? Yeah. Yeah. How did the uh, the your your work with Aretha seem to kind of end? Was that just because she had finally kind of gotten her own band with the uh, with King well, Curtis's you know, band? We did about well. She started using uh, bands all over. You know, California, yeah. everywhere. But uh, we did we did her about three years. Yeah, uh, I'd say three three good three good years. Her best records, I, we were we were lucky that we yeah. got to play on. Those are those are amazing records. When yeah, you never think. Yeah, that was yeah. a good one. Yeah, or seesaw. Seesaw. Or you know who wrote that? Don Covey. Don Covey. Yeah. Me and him used to write together when we'd go to New York. Really? Yeah. Did it, did it bear fruit? Uh, we never got it. I don't. Th- I don't know if we ever finished it. Yeah. But we'd you know we'd get together and, and we'd take we'd take a hit at it. Yeah. You know, on the session. Yeah. On the break. Yeah. <laughs> Record a demo and. Yeah. And, Try try to get it cut. What what is an example of you know? Because I'm I'm sure you recorded songs that you felt like this is an amazing song and it's going to be a hit and nothing happened. What, what's well, I, the big thing there, musicians are the worst guys that to pick hits. Why is that? I wish I knew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. We would usually pick the wrong ones. Really? I remember on the session of when a man loves a woman, uh, the I had two records picked ahead of that one. Okay. <laughs> and I'm ashamed. Yeah. You know, after what happened. <laughs> yeah. That thing sold a hundred million. Yeah. I've and, and it's still ab- selling. Yeah, absolutely believe that. Yeah. What a record. Is it is it strange to have songs that you recorded, you know, in the sixties and those songs are still being played a lot and and you can't well, go to you, our you know what we call that. What? They hold up. They hold up. They're quality. <laughs> <laughs> and and is it strange to hear like Land of a Thousand Dances? You can't go to a football game and not hear the pet band or the marching band play that song. <laughs> <laughs> is that strange? Yeah. Yeah. The Mustang Sally. <laughs> Mustang Sally. I mean that there that song's been played so many times there are certain bars that say don't play that song. <laughs> Just like Sweet Home Alabama. You know, another another song that uh, some bars will say don't play that well, song. Well you know who cut I'm the guy that sounds kindred. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Now what what happened with you know, because they ended up what what happened to the tape that that they ended up recutting all those most of those tunes with Al Cooper? Well, uh, I, I, I did a, a mix, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't hang around. I always liked the band to, to, to you know, be a part of the mix with me. Yeah. You know, when I was working on a record, and uh, they'd just leave, go home. Yeah. Back to Jacksonville, and uh, but they were an unbelievable. But you've heard of Hell House. Yeah. That's where they worked up all their songs. Okay. Had no air conditioning mm. in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like the almonds down in, in Macon and, and and them all living yeah. in a communal house and doing that. Mm. 
the documentary, the Muscle Shoals documentary that mm-hmm. came out, was it gratifying to have that come out and have your story told? Well, I have to say, I can't say it wasn't. It was. Yeah. It was, uh, I think, in our local area here, nobody knew what was going on here. Yeah. And uh, and we didn't really give out a lot of info. Yeah. And, uh, and as a result, you know, it was pretty secret. Yeah. And I'm glad that, you know, finally the area got proud of itself and its musical heritage, yeah. you know, and uh, based on what Rick started and we have carried on. Yeah. It's a very, very, very impressive, you know, legacy. So, <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm glad they, I, I remember seeing the documentary and, and my wife and another friend's wife went to see it and the, and the ladies beforehand were, uh, were complaining about going to see a music documentary. But when they saw that and they heard those songs <laughs> and they were blown away and they said it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty wild. I tell you, you know who cut that? Who? I mean, the guys that did the movie. I, I don't a remember. A guy named Stephen Badger. Okay. You ever have heard of him? No, I haven't heard of him. Well, Stephen Badger is the heir his his mother and his uncle her and his uncle mm-hmm. her her brother Mars Candy wow okay Snickers yeah think about Milky it. Way yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah Twix bars all those yeah yeah unbelievable yeah. that that documentary is so well made it's so it's well, well, it, yeah, yeah he spent eleven million on it yeah. of his personal money yeah. <laughs> and you know we didn't know who he was. Yeah. yeah. It took four years for him to make it. Right. Well, I knew something was strange because at my office they wanted to come to my house and do some filming. Mm-hmm. And when I when I pulled up at, at my house, my little office to go in it, there was about twenty five vehicles around it. Mm-hmm. I mean, trucks and makeup people and shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going like, what the hell is this? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I had to go I had to go about a block away to get to my house. Yeah. <laughs> you, had to, you had to walk to get to your own house, couldn't park in the driveway. Uh-uh. <laughs> and so they, they must have they must have done quite a bit of uh, interviewing with you and with everyone else that was involved in it. Well, they, they did a lot. Now, here's the thing. We went to, uh, do you remember uh, Sundance? Yeah. We went to Sundance okay. for the grand opening of it. Yeah. And uh, there was about 20 or 30 people of us went, yeah. made the trip. And uh, when we sat down in that theater and watched that thing for the first time, see, none of us knew what it was going to be about. Right. Because none of us saw any except the part we were in. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of that, after so many years, it started wearing thin, you know? Yeah. And But imagine a four years to make that movie. Mm-hmm. And that they go and get Bono yeah. to to do the, I mean they hired him yeah to do the, to do the narrating. kind of narration yeah that wasn't too bad was it? no it wasn't too bad <laughs> Jimmy so so all of a sudden you get to see this thing for the first time did did, did well I tell away? you what it did all of us sitting down watching it that went we all wept. I bet. We cried. Yeah. Because we had no idea. I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't even have told you what the damn thing was going to be about. Yeah. And, and we go, and, and when we've seen it all put together in that movie, it got us. Yeah. It was so, so well done. And uh, getting, getting to see... Rick Rick Hall's story, getting the, the yeah. Swampers, 
getting you know Percy's mm-hmm. all these you know and all, all these other characters, but there's the central characters <laughs> are are Rick Hall and you guys. Yeah. In a way, yeah, but I always consider it Rick's story. Yeah. Know? But yeah. and how we supported it, you know. Yeah. So did you uh, did you have uh, more people knowing who you were after that? Oh man. Yeah. It was uh, it's all the difference in the world around here. Yeah. <laughs> See, when we first pulled up here and uh, came in the first time into the building here, mm-hmm. the police came up wanting to know if we had a dance permit. Oh, <laughs> they thought you were going to... Yeah, they thought we were going to have yeah, a dance here. Because you're pulling in guitars and stuff, they think you're going to have a dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, But... The police became the the biggest fans we had yeah. locally, yeah. and they were here every day. Wow! They was wanting to meet every act that come in, and of course, and get to know them personally, and getting an autographs. Now here's the problem: there was yeah. no liquor here, right? Dry, dry County. County, yeah. So you will get put in jail. Uh, you, you, well, get, you get permission from well, the police. Well, what we did, we went and started, uh, we, downstairs we had a bar, mm-hmm. and we got a beer machine. And we'd go to the line and get kegs mm-hmm. of beer. And then, of course, we figured we was going to get busted. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. Because if you don't sell it, there's no law against it. Okay. We yeah. gave it away. Yeah, and so it was not a it was yeah. not a crime. No issue. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. So now, during the the making of the of the documentary, this this studio was not in in great condition, and so since then it's it's been renovated. Yeah. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah. How did it make you feel when when the first time you came through this this building and it was renovated? At, man, I was. I was blown away at how how what great a job they did. Yeah, did it did it feel like you were going back in time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, pretty wild. Of course, I tell you that th- this room, when the like when the stones were here, mm-hmm. uh, Keith will tell you it's the best studio he's ever been recorded in. Wow. Why didn't he come back? Well. I tell you the truth, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, they uh, they always said, uh, almost on, on all their big hits, they had wondered what it had been like if they'd cut them here. Right. Because that they, they think they might have been better. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you listen to Brown Sugar and, and the other... That the wasn't other, too slouchy. No, it wasn't too slouchy. <laughs> Was it was it tough work working with them? Wild horses. Yeah, wild horses. You know, great. Was was it tough working with them in kind of the state that they were in? I did three songs. Yeah. And you got to move. Yeah. And uh, in three days, and that they were here three days, and I did one. And I, we didn't start till six o'clock at night. Yeah. And I was running double shifts. Yeah. I was cutting in the daytime with R.B. Greaves, was doing an album on uh, the Take a Letter Maria album. Mm-hmm. Take a Letter Maria. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I was playing on that until about 5.30. Yeah. And then I'd have to change hats and go into engineering yeah. with them. Yeah. To about 1 or 2 in the morning. Yeah. Recording the Stones, were they were they playing at high volume with their amps? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, he had a twin amp with two JBL speakers in it. You talking about Keith? Keith. Yeah. And had it on ten. <laughs> and I said, "Oh shit!" And I put I finally I I put it back in that little room back there, yeah. and I put it in there, and it was still too. Loud. Yeah, because so much I mean, bleed through. It was so much. It was so loud. Yeah. And uh, 
and I was at a point, it was breaking up my console. Yeah, just too much signal. It was too much level. Yeah. And uh, I had remembered, I couldn't find my maintenance guy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so he had told me about something, this box he had left here. Okay. And I, I, I started looking for the box. Okay. It was a bump box. Okay. And that bumped the level down. Ah. And I took a RCA DX seventy seven DX RC. You know the RCA looks like a Larry King show. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? And uh, that mic. It's a it's a ribbon mic. I put it in there. Yeah. In the room, you know, mm-hmm. with the amp. Yeah. And uh, because it's breaking up my board. Yeah. So I dropped it down 20 dB. <laughs> and I didn't even know how to plug the damn thing in. And I figured, right. I just said, yeah. and, I, and I, 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 I did it. I don't yeah. know how in the hell, cause yeah. I did it. Yeah. And uh, because I was I already practicing my speech that, yeah. that, that's going to have to leave. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Keith. Mick. And uh, I remember I came uh, back there and I walked up here mm-hmm. after I set it, set it all up and I came in this room and there, there there was the brown sugar guitar sound. Okay. And I said, and then tears came in my eyes. What guitar was he playing? Uh, he had about four or five guitars. I, I can't remember which one. Maybe. He was playing on that particular one, well, and then but he was just plugged direct into that that Les Paul. I mean the uh, the the twin reverb, you know, turned to ten with the JBLs on it. Wide open. Yeah, wide open. The <laughs> ten was a bullet. Yeah. And who played acoustic on uh, on Wild Horses and stuff? Was that, that Keith? Was, or? Uh, no, that was that guy that. The, the guy, the new guy that just came uh, on Mick the band. Taylor had just... Mick Taylor. Okay. Yeah. 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 In any other, uh, you know, gear, gear uh, horror stories? <laughs> <laughs> well, n- n- none that that vivid. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That really got me. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked out. Yeah. And there, were, there was the sound. And... and uh, and then yeah, I, I had I got this phone call. He was probably the number one engineer in England. What's his name? Glenn Johns. That's him. Glenn okay. Johns. Glenn Johns and his brother. Okay. Well, Glenn Johns calls me. Yeah. One day, about two years later, and he was finishing the record. Okay, because it didn't get released till later. Right. It was right. A late release. Yeah. And so he called me and he said. He said, Jimmy, I just had to call you and tell you this. He said, he said, I never beat your mix on your rough. He said, I never beat it. Wow. And I said, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Johns was an unbelievable guy. You got to read yeah. his book. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, he's a great I engineer mean, and producer. Jimmy, I want to thank you so much for letting us come down to Muscle Shoals Sound Studio and and getting to getting to talk with you, getting to have you tell some of your story. It was just a a great honor and a privilege. Thank you. I hope I didn't cuss too much. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna give we you a take pass. that out. Yeah, if if you want us to, we will take that out. I didn't know that Bob Seger and Glenn Fry were buddies. I, I knew that from the uh, the Eagles documentary. Okay. Yeah. But that I that, didn't know if you knew that. Well, it, it you know there's a, a couple records we did that the Eagles sang on. Really? Which one? Uh, I have to. You remember? Can you remember our cuts? Uh, well, the the stuff with there's Seager. There's so many cuts. I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> but, my mind so, is so. But the the Eagles came came in. I guess when they were in town, or they or they came in specifically to well, sing. Well, they, they actually uh, Eagles came in to to uh, actually they were Linda Ronstadt's road band. Right. 
You remember that? Yes. Well, Linda Ronstadt comes here. Okay. So we're cutting her here. Okay. And that's, and, uh, when, and that's when the Eagles came in when... when well, the, what it was, they wouldn't let them come over. They had to stay at the hotel. Okay. And so they would come over when we were on a break or we were done. Okay. For the night. Yeah. And so yeah. I, one day I come in here and Glenn Fry was in here and he was telling them, he says, hey guys, if we just stick together, we'll make it. <laughs> and I'm going, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> They stuck together for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>